build cities for the people in the countryside. The only way to equate is to bring everybody in the countryside. But then they looked around and they said, and they're still not equal. Some people know how to read, some people are smart, some people have an education. How are we going to equate that? Kill them. Yeah. So they killed them. They killed 2 million out of a population of 5, 40% of the population. They killed anybody who had a degree. They killed anybody who showed any kind of special talent. You had glasses, you were shot. That's the killing fuels of you. That's the image you should hold when people talk about equality of outcome. Because that's what it means. It means killing anybody, destroying anybody who has any kind of ability that, that is above the most lowest common denominator. That's what it means. And equality of opportunity is what's the difference? Now equality of opportunity in a sense that we have the same laws, so you can you can choose whatever you want and you have freedom. That's great. But that's not what's meant by quality of opportunity. Quality of opportunity means taking the poor kid and giving him more money because he didn't have as many opportunities as the rich kid. It means, you know, this guy has connections, so somehow getting this guy into Harvard or whatever, so he gets connections. That's wrong. That's wrong. Is the philosophy of self-interest at odds with Christianity? <laughs> I'm not a theologian. <laughs> That's my diplomatic answer. <laughs> now, my best understanding of Christianity is yes, that they're in conflict. But I know Christians who believe they're not in conflict. My view is, that's your problem, not mine. I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> but I read the Sermon on the Mount as being consistent with socialism. That's how I read it. That's my understanding of it. We can have a theological debate. It's not very fruitful, and I'm not very good at it. I know the Old Testament. I can tell you the Old Testament. I mean, I'm sure there's some other Jews here. The Old Testament is incompatible with capitalism. It's just incompatible. There's no freedom of speech in the Old Testament. You know when Moses comes down from the Mount, Mount Sinai, and he's got the Ten Commandments, right? And these Jews have chosen to worship a golden calf. They chose it, right? They didn't force other Jews to do it. They chose to do it. So he didn't put the Ten Commandments down and go up to them and say, you know, this is a better deal. Give up the golden calf. <laughs> no, he dropped the Ten Commandments, broke them, pissed off, you know, big guy. And he took out a sword and he killed 30,000 of them. I think it was 30,000, right? That's freedom of speech. They exercised a different religion than what he believed in, so he killed them. That's incompatible with, with freedom of speech as I understand it. Now, again, not a theologian, but this is, I remember my Old Testament. The good parts, at least. Okay, here's one that, yeah, more of your line. Can you explain why Jews seem to do so well practicing capitalism and freedom in America, but don't vote for it? Yes. I have the explanation. People have been searching for this for at least a hundred years. <laughs> Milton Friedman wrote an essay on it. Uh, there's a book by Norman Podhovitz about just this question that came out about a year or two ago. Why are Jews so liberal when they are these huge beneficiaries of capitalism? And they are. They've done well. They were the poor and ignorant who came to this country in the late 19th century. They were. They were, they were from the shtetl, the little villages in Poland and Russia. They had nothing. Not even a, a decent education. And they made it under capitalism. Why are they turning their backs against it? Because they're intellectual. Because they take morality seriously. Because they believe in morality. They don't practice it. Now what happens? What hap they don't. What, they don't. Nobody practices pure altruism. You can't. It's death. So what happens when you act the one way? but you believe in something else. You know, you're acting like Bill Gates, but you should be Mother Teresa. <laughs> guilt. That conflict inside of you, what you do versus what you should do, is guilt. The Jews in the audience recognize this? <laughs> guilt, right? So they're torn by the guilt, and Jews take this stuff seriously, whereas others don't. Jews have guilt and guilt. Guilt and guilt. They have guilt because of the guilt. Guilt is funny. It's, it's a combination of being intellectual, and the intellectual field being dominated by the left for 200 years, and the guilt that's associated with their success, and them taking it seriously, more seriously than many of the Christians. You know, if I can comment on Christianity. Christianity in America has been really interesting. Because American Christians are very different than Christians anywhere else in the world. 
Because what happens is, America is founded on a certain spirit, which I think is not consistent with European Christianity, let's call it that way. So what Americans have done, have reinterpreted Christianity to fit their American beliefs. So you will find in American churches people say, yes, go out there, make money, it's good, the Lord wants you to make money. You won't hear that in Europe, or South America, or Asia. That's not the Christianity that most people practice. That's very American. We have taken Christianity in this country and shaped it to fit our American beliefs, because we're more American than we are Christian. And I know people get insulted when I say this, but this is this is what I believe in. You know, I say this in the South, and people really get upset. <laughs> but, but no other country are evangelicals pro capitalism if you go to evangelical communities in South America, they're socialists. Or in Europe, they're socialists. Only in America are they pro-capitalism because the capitalism comes first, the Christianity second. I'm in trouble now. Yeah. <laughs> are there any government social programs that are consistent with uh, freedom? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Every government social program requires that something be taken from you by force and given to somebody else. That force, that coercion that's involved in taking from you and giving to somebody else is wrong. We call that, when it's done one-on-one, -on -one, theft. <laughs> Somehow, if we vote on it, it's okay. It's legitimized, but it's wrong, it's immoral to take from some people and give to other people against their wishes. If people want to give, all the power to them, it's called charity, and that's how we managed quite well in the 19th century, and that's what we should return to. But taking by force is wrong, and that's true of every single social program out there, including the pseudo-saving programs like Social Security. It's a pyramid scheme, it's a scam that takes, it's the largest, you know, Medicare is worse than Social Security. Medicare will be the largest redistribution of wealth in human history. And it's from young people who are poor generally to old people who are generally rich. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Save. Anybody heard of saving? Yes. <laughs> Save. You know, buy insurance. Protect yourself. And if you don't, if you're irresponsible and you haven't saved and you haven't bought insurance, then go to charity. Ask for help, but you don't have a right to somebody else's stuff. You can't pull a gun and take somebody else's stuff. Then how come it becomes okay to get the government to pull a gun and take somebody else's stuff? It's still somebody else's stuff. It's wrong. If you care about it, we don't care about people. Bad luck hits them, something bad happens to them. It's not their fault that they're in bad situations. What do we do? We help them. Out of the goodness of our own heart, because we want to help them. But some of us can't. You know, some of us have more important stuff to do, which is fine, the kids are in trouble. But the government doesn't differentiate, the government comes and pulls a gun and takes your money, whether you have other stuff to do with the money or not. That is wrong. It's immoral. Social Security, Medicaid, these are immoral programs. That's the moral high ground. And you remember, Republicans used to believe this. I mean, this isn't, I mean, it sounds no. radical. But you listen to Ronald Reagan's speech from 1964 at the Republican National Convention. It'll blow your mind. He was so good then. And he challenged Medicaid. He challenged on moral grounds and on practical grounds. He was against Medicaid in 64 before it was passed. Once it's passed, everybody's for it, right? And in the 30s and 40s, Republicans wanted to undo Social Security. They wanted to get rid of it. It was an emergency measure for the Great Depression. Enough. And now it's like nobody challenges. We want to save it. Obama wants to save it. Romney wants to save it. Who do you think is going to save it more? If you have two people who believe fundamentally the same thing, people will vote for the one who believes it more. Romney and Obama believed in the same thing. Obama was more convincing. We need a candidate who believes in something different. Ronald Reagan would have won this election. Ronald Reagan would have won. Anybody projecting a vision for America different than this guy would have beaten Obama. Obama was easily beatable. You needed the right candidate. This, this was a pathetic candidate. This is a guy, 
let me just say something about Romney, right? The number one issue going into this election, the number one issue going into this election was Obamacare. American people did not want it. They didn't like it. They didn't want it implemented. It polled against Obama everywhere. So what did Republicans do? They nominated the one guy who could not argue against Obamacare because he invented it. I mean, Obamacare is Obamacare. It is, and he couldn't get out of it. So he, it was not an issue in the, in the debates. It wasn't an issue in the campaign because Romney couldn't argue against Obamacare. So he lost. Shock. If you've got Romney Care versus Obamacare, who are you going to go for? They're more consistent. Obama's more consistent. Have you considered running for office? <laughs> I consider it every time I'm asked that question. And my answer is, I would lose in a landslide. I mean, I'm not advocating for me to run against Obama, for somebody like me to run against Obama, right? Because we would lose in a, I just argue for somebody better than Romney to run against Obama. You know, somebody who's got a spine to run against Obama. That's what I'm arguing. You know, I'd be happy with the Ronald Reagan type of person who run. It could be better than Ronald Reagan, but somebody like that. Right? If I ran, I would lose in a landslide. The, the ideas that I presented today are radical. <laughs> you can't win with my ideas. But my job is not to run for office. My job is to define where we need to go. You guys move along the path there. You can find solutions on how to get there. But my job is to define this, the pure form, what it looks like, capitalism, and what the fundamental ideas that need to be changed in order to get there. And then how you do it, how you run for office advocating the ideas and still getting elected, that you guys are going to have to do. I'm not going to do that. Somebody has to define a vision. Somebody has to give that vision of what we're heading and why we're heading there. And that's, that, in my view, is Ayn Rand's job. That's my job. And, you know, any office that I could get elected to today would not be worth running for. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I could get elected a dog catcher. You know. Are free markets good because they work or because they are moral? Both. There's no dichotomy between the two. One of the reasons they're moral is because they work. And one of the reasons they work is because they're no, because they're consistent with human nature. They're consistent with our incentives and what gets us going and what motivates them, what inspires us. Right? So the two are the same. The work stuff, I think, is done. It works. It's the moral side that we have to accept. And that's, that's where you have to become an individualist. You have to believe in individualism. You have to understand individualism. Because that's what capitalism is about. They're not moral if you're a collectivist. For collectivism, capitalism is a net, you know, is 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 the opposite. You know, it's it's anti-collectivist. So as long as you're collectivist, as long as we as a culture are collectivists, altruists, we will not have capitalism, even though it works. Okay, besides liberals changing the language, what else have they done in the last 100 years to move America to the left? <coughs> well, I mean. Where do you start? You know, the progressive movement in the late 19th century, early 20th century, had a profound impact on this culture. Uh, they, you know, they came to dominate our educational establishments. They came to dominate, dominate the intellectual life of America. Uh, they trained the PhDs in the humanities, so they dominate that world. Uh, they write the books, they create the arts. Every aspect of our culture is touched by this ideology. This is why it's such a hard battle. Every aspect of the culture is touched by their ideology. And it makes it very difficult to argue, you know, to, to argue against it because they're everywhere. And, and it's not like they sat a hundred years ago and went, hmm, how can we do this? <laughs> they didn't, but what they did understand and what the right has never understood is that the battle is an educational battle. It's about education, education, education. It's about getting PhDs, it's about going into the schools, it's about being teachers, and they did that work. They were always inclined to be intellectuals. They, you know, when, when, when you were rich in the late 19th century, you wanted your kids to get the best education in the world, where did you send them? Harvard. To Europe. And they brought those ideas back with them. And when Harvard and Yale wanted to become world-class institutions, where did they go to get their top professors? Europe. To Europe. And they brought those ideas with them. 
And that's how you undercut the American ideas, is by importing the intellectuals from Europe. Much better to get those poor, miserable, ignorant farmers um, than to get the intellectuals. Intellectuals brought a poisonous philosophy with them, and it's destroyed America. Okay, what would an Ayn Rand objectivist foreign policy look like? I thought I was radical until now. Um, <laughs> so, really simple. Uh, the job of government is to do one thing and one thing only, that's protect the rights of Americans, the individual rights of Americans, the right to life and the right to property, right? So, the only purpose of American foreign policy is to protect us from people trying to kill us, steal our stuff. But if somebody tries to kill us, we don't apologize. <coughs> We find them and we destroy them. And we don't worry about what that entails. We destroy them. So, you know, our foreign policy shouldn't be about foreign aid. We shouldn't do foreign aid, right? We shouldn't be distributing wealth in America, never mind outside of America. But the worst of all, talk about altruism, the worst of all is when we give billions of dollars to our sworn enemies. Right? So the Muslim Brotherhood is the fountainhead of Al-Qaeda. They're getting $2 billion of your money every year because they happen to win an election in Egypt. Why can't we just say to them, Egyptians, you can vote for whoever you want. You're right. right? But if you vote for the Muslim Brotherhood, that's fine. You're just not going to get our money. Uh, I believe that when somebody rams, they air, you know, hijacks airplanes and rams them into our buildings and kills Americans, you find everybody responsible. And I'm not just talking about the individual people responsible, but the ideology responsible, the people that fund this. And we're talking about countries, and you destroy them. You don't build democracy. You don't give them a good life. You destroy them. You destroy them. And, you know, what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan will go down as one of the most horrific things any American. I mean, I'm a, I'm a hater of George Bush that no Democrat comes close to how much I hate this guy, because he gave such a bad name to the right. He was such, so pathetic after 9-11. Every speech he gave was a compromising, appeasing speech after 9-11. You know, they celebrated the Ramadan a month after 9-11 in the White House. I mean, this guy gave war and, and freedom and these concepts a bad name. He did more damage to this country than anybody, except maybe Barack Obama. But, you know, that's not how you fight a war. If FDR had given the speech after Pearl Harbor that George Bush gave after 9-11, he would have been, there would have been riots in the streets and he would have been impeached. It just shows you how far we've come as a people that we let George Bush get away with. You know, terrorists didn't strike us on 9-11. That's like saying kamikaze pilots struck us on Pearl Harbor. I mean, who's behind the two? Yeah, which specific leaders or individuals who execute or advocate some of the things you've told, talked about tonight could win? I think there are a lot of Republicans who could win. Um, anybody, you know, none of the people, none of the candidates that Republicans actually put up this year could have won. I mean, this was the most pathetic field in, uh, that I remember. But, but a lot of Republicans today could win. Now, nobody, again, nobody is as radical as I am and could win. But I think Paul Ryan, if he was at the top of the ticket, could win. Um, if, he, if he could open his mouth and actually articulate his ideas rather than be muzzled by Mitt Romney. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of talent among the younger Republicans out there. I think 2016 they'll have, they'll have better candidates. But they're still, you know, they're still compromised. I still don't see anybody standing up and making, not my moral case, but a moral case for capitalism. A real, you know, inspiring speech to, 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 to really capture the American people. I mean, is it going to be Rubio or, you know, I guess Christie's now history, but, you know, it's, there was hope for Christie, I guess, at some point. I don't know where it's going to come from, but I think there are better people out there. There's a generation of young Republicans who are better. They're not great, but they're better. And, you know, hopefully one of them will, will rise to the challenge. And many of them were influenced by Ayn Rand. They're not Ayn Rand, you know, uh, they don't believe in the philosophy, but they were influenced by it, like Paul Ryan. Who was influenced? He went into politics because I'm a shrug. Yeah. You know, but he, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Would you say that most democracies, if not all of them, are doomed to uh, socialism and due to their politicians' hunger for power? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by democracy. Democracy is a tricky word. If you mean by democracy majority rule, that is the majority can vote on anything, then yes, democracy is a bad, bad system. The funny fellow has called it the tyranny of the majority. You know the story of Socrates? Socrates was a great philosopher, and he used to walk around Athens, you know, debating the youth and, and you know, challenging their religion, challenging their values. And the elders of, of Athens got together and said, this guy's corrupting our youth. We got to do something, right? So they voted. They got, it was a democracy. And they all voted. What did they vote for? The only way to silence Socrates is what? Kill him. Because he's not going to, he's not going to fall until he stops speaking. So they decided to kill him. And they voted. And it was democracy. And they killed him. You know, he drank the, the poison chalice. You know, Plato told him, I've got a tunnel, we can escape. <laughs> and Socrates, no, I believe in democracy. You, we drank the poison. Um, you know, I don't know if that's true. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's a good story. That's democracy. Democracy always leads to authoritarianism of one form or another. Pure democracy. Now, in modern terms, in America, when we talk about democracy, it's limited democracy, where we limit what people can vote on. So I'm all for voting, but it's just not on anything important. <laughs> right? Your property rights. Nobody should vote on your property rights. Nobody should be able to vote on how much money to take away from you. Nobody should be able to vote on what to use your property for. Nobody should be able to vote to, to, to confiscate your stuff. Right? That's not, that's property rights. That's your right to your life, your liberty. So rights are inalienable. Remember that word? Inalienable? Yeah. Therefore you can't vote on them. That's why we have a Bill of Rights. And you know why Madison objected to the Bill of Rights? You know why Madison objected? He didn't want a Bill of Rights because he said the problem with the Bill of Rights is that people will think these are the only rights. And the government can do everything else and violate our rights in every other realm. Now luckily he lost that argument because what does the Bill of Rights serve today? At least to some extent those rights are being protected. So for example, we have very clear, we have a right to speech. So the right to free speech is relatively protected today. If there was the Bill of Rights, that would be gone. So, but that's the point. The point is that God, there's very little you vote for. And how often did the legislature, you, you know, in Texas, they, they meet once a year, once every two years. For like six months or something, because there's not much to do. <laughs> I mean, in a free country, politicians, it's a part-time job. It's not a lot to do. Right? You're just left alone, free to do your stuff. One last question. One last question. Okay. Make it a good one. <laughs> Pressure's on. Okay. What, what is the... <laughs> debating which one's good. <laughs> the question simply is, no one here questions your message. But what is the channel by which we can educate the youth of majority? And so forth. Through education. So I doubt that that's true, first of all. I doubt that everybody here accepts my message. I hope that's true, but I, I, I'm skeptical. The question is we all accept the message, that's the assumption. And the question is well, what do we do with it? Right? How do we take this out and influence the youth and minorities? And, well, first of all, we have to articulate, we have to speak. And we have to speak in these terms, not in a watered down, wishy-washy, bainer language, right? <laughs> we need to speak in the absolutist, consistent, moral terms. We're not running for office. We can talk about radical stuff. And we need to, because we need to define what that means. But more than that, particularly with young people, particularly with poor people, particularly with minorities, see, Mitt Romney's 47% comment was an awful, awful, awful comment. Not because he said it, but because of what it means. It means Republicans have given up on those people. And that's horrible. Because who needs freedom more than anybody else? It's the poor. I mean, the entitlement state, the biggest victims of the entitlement state are the poor. Because they're institutionalized into poverty. They're told, don't worry, don't work, don't get a job. Here's a check. Where do you get your self-esteem from? Your from your work, from your success. If you never go to work, you'll never have self-esteem. And if you don't have self-esteem, you'll never be yeah. H-word, happy. We need self-happiness. 
And to sell happiness, you have to sell self-esteem. And to sell self-esteem, you have to sell work and the value of work. Hundred years ago, you could have been a bricklayer, a poor bricklayer. But you knew you were taking care of your own family. You got proud, you were proud of the fact that you could manage, could live, and give your kids and your family a life. Even though it was hard work, even though it wasn't the most interesting work, even though you weren't rich, you did it. You weren't dependent on other people. So people had pride, they had self-esteem. We need to give that back to people. So we need to argue to the minorities that they are the victims, to the poor, that they are the victims. What they need is freedom. What they need is capitalism. We need to argue against things like minimum wage. What does the minimum wage do? It's unemployment. It prices some people out of the labor market. If you're a kid and your labor is only worth six bucks and the minimum wage is ten, you'll never get a job. It means you'll never earn the skills that allow you to one day make ten, twenty, forty, a hundred bucks an hour. But we need to explain that to people. They don't know. They've been taught that the minimum wage is to help them, even though they're unemployed. Somehow it's helping them. Right? So we need to, we need to, the only way to change the world, the only way to change the world, there's no silver bullet, there's no magic formula, there's no one candidate, there's nothing except our ability to speak and speak and speak. Yeah. Right, right, and right. It's about communicating the message. We have got to be out there communicating the message. And again, not the wishy-washy message. Let the politicians do that. The principle, inspiring message, the message about freedom, the message about opportunities, not equality of opportunities, real opportunities. The message about happiness, about self-esteem, about success, about work, about pride, about taking responsibility for your own life. That's the message we should be articulating every single day in every venue we can. You know, we're outnumbered 10 to 1, 100 to 1, I don't know. So we got to work harder. That's it. Thank you all.